Hi, this is Seshwani Gopal, and you're watching another lesson in data structures and algorithms. In this lesson, we're taking up from where we left off in the first part of the quicksort discussion, in which we saw how the quicksort algorithm works. In the second part, we'll implement the algorithm in Java. If you're somewhat rusty with the algorithm, you may want to review the first part and then come back here. Okay, let's get started. In the first part, we saw how quicksort works in various examples, so we have ample information to seed our algorithm. We can use this information to either write the algorithm in pseudocode and then implement it in Java, or we can jump directly to the Java code. I'm going to go directly to Java. The coding may be somewhat nonlinear because we'll build it from the examples, and this may need us to go back and forth. But it's more realistic this way. Code doesn't just appear magically in some neat package. Switching to Eclipse, let's first make a package called sort. And in this package, let's make a class called quicksort. I don't want a main method in this class, so let's leave this box unchecked. Later, we'll write a small application to take our quicksort implementation for a spin. Now, in this class, let's start with a method that will be called to the quicksort. It will accept an array of objects that can be compared for equality less than and greater than. So I'm going to have to write up a generic comparable type like this. Now, I made this method static because it takes an array as input and sorts it. And when it's done, there is no state to be maintained for later calls. So it really is a standalone function implementation, not some operation on an object. Now, the first thing to do in this method is to make sure the array has at least two things in it. If not, there is nothing to do, and we can just return. So if list.length is less than or equal to 1, we can just return. Otherwise, we need to start up the recursive sort process. To do this, we'll call another method, which will take the list. And its extent, which are the low and high index markers as parameters. And this top level recursive call the low end is 0, the first index in the array, and the high end of the extend is the last index, which is list.length minus 1. OK, this takes us to the recursive method. Let's write it up here. Now, the recursive method is static as well, and it has the same generic typing. And notice that. This method, method is private because we don't expect it to be called from outside the application. In fact, it should not be called from outside the quicksort um, class, but only from within the other sort method. So we make it private. And it accepts a list of objects again, low index, high index. Now, in this method, the first thing to do is to split the array. But we need to do this only if the array has at least two items. Otherwise, we have hit the bottom of the recursion tree, and we can return from the method. Now, you can write this up either um, everything in an if statement, if there's at least two items. Or you can check if there aren't enough items and just return. Otherwise, continue with the rest of the code. I prefer the latter because it's one fewer level of nesting of conditions. And there's less context to carry in your head when you're reading it later, um, maybe when you're debugging. So I'm going to do this. If list, uh, if, uh, sorry, high minus low is less than or equal to 0, there are fewer than two items. Then return. And if you fall through, it means there's at least two things in the array, and we're ready to go. 
So as we did in the previous sort method, we're just going to call split, make up a method call right here. The method will return um, a split point, which is the place where the um, pivot ends up. So let's grab that in a variable, call the method. I'm going to call it split, pass to it the list low and high. And when the method returns, all we have to do is to set up the recursive calls for the left and right subarrays, which is just simply call sort with the list. Low is the low index. The high index is going to be split point minus one. This is the left subarray recursion. And the right subarray recursion is list. The low index is going to be split point plus one, and the high index is the original high. Okay, so this pretty much finishes up this method. And all that remains to be done is to implement the split method, which is, of course, the heart of the algorithm. Let me just save this. Now let's go up and write up the header for the split method. So again, private. Um, it's going to have to be static again. Again, the generic type because we're going to accept the input array as a parameter. Returns an integer list parameter low index, high index. All right, I'm going to stick in this placeholder return negative one just to make the compiler happy. So there we have it, our top level code structure. To fill in the implementation of the split method, we'll take another look at the examples to distill the branches and logic out of which we will build our code. Let's start with setting up the left and right indices. The left index is set to one after low, and the right index is set to high. Since we'll be comparing the items against the pivot, which is at index low, it would be convenient to set a variable to this, tpivot is set to list low. Now let's think about the logic of moving left and right. There are two levels to this. At the inner level, we move left until it can't move anymore. Then we move right until it can't move anymore. Let's call this one sweep through the array. Question is, what conditions establish termination of these respective moves? Then at the outer level, the left and right moves or sweeps must be repeated until there are no more items in the array to be compared against the pivot. Which begs the next question. How do we know when this point has been reached? Let's start with the first question. When to stop moving left and right in any one sweep? The left index starts moving first. In one of the extreme examples we saw, it moves all the way to the end, past the right index. In the other extreme, it makes one comparison and stops right away. So in general, we can move the left index as long as it is not past the right. So while left is less than or equal to right, provided it is less than the pivot. So as long as list left compared to pivot, is less than zero, it keeps moving. But if not, it has to stop. So we put a break here so we can bail out and that will stop the left from moving. After left has stopped, we start moving right. But it can only move as long as it is greater than left. So while right is greater than left. 
provided it is not less than the pivot, which gives us exactly the reverse of the left move logic. So here we can go if left, if list right dot compared to pivot is less than zero, then we break, otherwise keep moving right. So at this point, we're done with the sweep. What next? Time to ask a couple of questions. First one, will there be more sweeps or is this it? In other words, are there still items left to be compared with the pivot or not? If left is greater than right, then no. Also, if left and right are the same position, then no. In these two cases, all sweeps are done, all items have been rearranged, and all that is left to be done is to bring the pivot to the split point spot. So we can bail out. So if left is greater than or equal to right, then break. Now, the break here is really going to be breaking out of the containing outer level loop which we haven't still written but we'll get to it shortly if this condition is not met we're still in business the items at left and right must be swapped with each other so swap left and right items let's set attempt to hold the left item Set the left to the item at right and set right to temp. And we need to advance left and right one step in their respective directions. So left plus plus, right minus minus. And also I see that I forgot the semicolon here. Let's fix that. And this should be a semicolon as well. This whole thing here must be in a containing loop. Since the termination of the loop has already been coded right here, we can simply make this loop spin as long as it's true and we can indent this code um, correct indentation now we can't actually write in a condition such as left equals uh, less than right which is the opposite of the break condition up here at the top because that condition is only checked after left has done its thing so this loop structure will work just fine Okay, so after all the sweeps are done outside of this while loop, the pivot needs to be moved to the split point position. From the examples in part one, we already know that this is one index before left. So we need to switch low with left minus one. Since we already have the pivot in another variable, we don't need another temp. We can just use that variable to do the switch. So swap pivot with left minus one position. We can just say list low is list left minus one and list left minus one is assigned the pivot. And finally, we will return the split point, which simply happens to be left minus one. So let's just change that placeholder to return left minus one, and we're done. Well, I guess we can't really say we're done until we test the code. So here's an application quicksort app that I wrote up to kick the tires in our implementation. It takes a comma separated list of integers as input, loads them into an array, calls the quicksort classes sort method for this array, and prints the array when the call returns. Here's an example run with just two items to show the input and output formats. So let's 
run this as a Java application. Let's do two and one. So that's the array before the sort method is called and afterwards is sorted correctly, of course. Okay, so now let's try all permutations of item arrangements in a small list, say of size three. Let's use the integers one, two, and three. So here goes. Let's run this. So first let's do one, two, three. That gives one, two, three back. Then let's try one, three, two. Gives one, two, three. Let's try two, one, three. Oh, let's try two, three, one. And the last two, three first, one and two. And the last one, three first, two and one, reverse sorted, gives one, two, three. Okay, looking good so far. So to mix it up a little, let's use some of the examples that we covered in part one. So this is one example, 15, 12, uh, 13, 11, 20, 15, 22, and 14. Let's check this out. 11, 12, 13, 14, 2 15s, 20, and 22. And that's correct. Let's try the rivers sorted list that we used in the examples in the first part. 8, 7, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8. Looks good. Let's try a sorted list. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And that looks good as well. And here's one more example from the part 1 collection. 7, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 8, 9. That gives 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 8, 9. And now let's try something that is larger, say like 20 things. So I'm just going to randomly put 20 th integers in some sequence. 12, 13, 56, 2, 18, negative 5, 10, 8, um, 17, 2. So we have about 10 so far. 0, 19, 76, 43. 87. So I guess I'm just ballparking here. We have about 15 or 16. Let's do like five more. 1, 9, um, 66, 42, 29. And that gives negative 5, 0, 1, 2, 2, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 17, 18, 19, 29, 42, 43, 56, 66, 76, 87. Looks perfect. And just to top it off, let's try a single item list like uh, this. And that works. Okay, so it all looks good. Our implementation is holding up and now we can say we're done. We have a working program that will apply the quicksort algorithm correctly. It should work on any kind of data so long as they can be compared with each other for ordering. So for instance, you may want to try sorting lists of strings when you have a chance. One last thing, we saw in part one that the sorted list takes the most time to sort because of the lopsided nature of the splits. At every split, all items go to one side of the pivot and none to the other. This is pretty bad because we expect a sorting algorithm to do the least amount of work on an array that's already sorted. Well, the good news is there's a simple fix to this issue. Also, there are a couple of other tricks that make quicksort go faster in real time which are useful, even though these will not change the bigger running times. In practice, every little ounce of speed that can be squeezed out is precious. These fine-tuning techniques are topics for another video, so for now, we're going to call it quits. I look forward to seeing you later. Take care.